Pond Boss Pond Management Basics. Three, two, one. Hey, Mr. Pond Boss, tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello, Chico. How in the world are you doing, my longtime friend? It's a beautiful day. <laughs> We're in the neighborhood. In this neighborhood, yes. <laughs> That's right. Here at the Pond Boss uh, headquarters, I guess we well, could call kinda, it. Well, kind of, yeah. We call it, yeah. yeah home base. We home call base. this yeah. Lusk Landing right here because we're right over there is the Brazos River where we can just go out and skip rocks and trap minnows and maybe catch a pretty good bass. Debbie caught about a three and a half pound bass the other day right out there. Oh, really? Yeah, we had one of those uh, bluebird days, you know, here in, in mm-hmm. January and we got out with a neighbor on a, on a cool little raft type boat and... She was throwing a jerk bait that looks kind of like a red horse minnow. I and saw you when you posted yeah, that. That yeah. looked like a lot of fun. She had a blast. I think I think you need one of those boats. Uh, you know what? I know we do. <laughs> She's already got it picked out. I got a feeling. So, hey, let's talk a little bit about the basics of pond management today. I want to welcome everybody, and we're going to get into this topic hot and heavy. Now, there's when, when I go give talks, I start mm-hmm. talking about the very first speech I give is about the fundamentals and the basics of pond management. And by the way, I've got a book out about that now. Mm-hmm. So it's called Beyond the Basics. You know, in this book, I think, I don't remember, I think it's like 20 bucks or something. So it's not like it's going to break the bank. But but this goes into much greater detail than we have time to talk about on the podcast. People can find this at pondboss.com. Greetings, Bob Lusk here. Editor of Pond Boss Magazine and longtime fisheries biologist. Welcome to the Pond Boss Podcast Series. Got some great topics lined up for you. Glad you're coming along. We are brought to you by Purina Mills, makers of Aquamax Fish Foods, Texas Hunter Products, makers of fantastic fish feeders and other hunting products, Easy Docs, and HuntBirdDog.com. We're glad you're here. Let's go have some fun together and get our learning curve up. When, when I start talking about it, everything starts with water. And I call it happy water. If the water's not happy, nothing else I'm going to talk about makes any difference. You know, and, and, and the way water works, it's, it's dynamic, it's fluid, it's always changing. Water is the medium. So the water hosts a lot of things that occur with biology. The chemistry of the water influences the biology. The biology influences the chemistry. If you got a lot of plants, it can influence the chemistry of the water because in the daylight hours, the plants are going to photosynthesize. It means they're going to take up carbon dioxide and produce oxygen and give off oxygen and dissolve it into the water. And then at night, it does conversely. So the pH can ebb and flow, especially if the alkalinity is low. So let's just say this. You got to have happy water, which can mean aeration. It can mean monitoring your water chemistry and understanding that. It could mean monitoring and managing your plankton blooms and your algae blooms and how much aquatic plants you have. So the medium of the water is it's got to be happy. The second thing is the habitat. And my little phrase is as goes the habitat, so goes what lives in it. Mm-hmm. So if you don't have the right habitat, for the different species of fish that you want to manage and the different sizes of those species you're going to manage, your pond is not going to be as successful as it could be. Hmm. You know, so what we're looking at, the very first thing I do is sit down and is with a, uh, with a landowner and say, Hey, what's the mission? What are your goals? Mm-hmm. How do you want it to be? Never the same, is it? No, no. Now there's a lot of, a lot of the goals that are parallel but this land, I, I met with a guy about 30 miles from here a couple of days ago, and he says, you know, I built this pond because my son, who's a senior in high school, loves to fish. It's seeping. I'm not sure how to fix that. This is a weekend place for us, so we've got it in VRBO. But the pond, is I want it to be aesthetically appealing. I want it to look good. I want it to grow some fish that my son can enjoy, and I want him to manage the fish. He says, and when my wife comes and looks at it and she wants to sit on that bench over there and read a book, I want her to be comfortable. That's my goal. Where another guy might say, you know what, Bob? I sold my bass boat. I bought this land. I want to build a lake and grow the biggest bass on the planet. You know, another one 
might say, hey, I want my grandkids to be able to catch some bluegill off the dock. You know, so now today's world, ponds are built with specific purposes. So we're like 50 years ago, they go get a bulldozer, scoop out a hole that looks like a bowl, do a rain dance, let it fill up with water. And oh, by the way, I can put some fish in it. It's not like that now. People, There's still some of that going on. It's because people don't know what they don't yeah. know. Okay. You know, so when people build a pond now, there's a lot more planning that goes into it. So if you've got happy water and you've got the right kind of habitat, and what I mean by that as an example is that baby bluegill have different needs than largemouth bass. And small, ba- small largemouth bass have different lifestyles than a double-digit largemouth bass. So you've got to figure out how you can have the right spawning beds the right places for the fish to lay eggs. You got to have the right kind of habitat for bait fish. You got to have the right kind of habitat for the other fish you're managing, like threadfin shad. They're open water fish, but they're filter feeders. They glean their food out of the water. If you don't have food in the water, they're not going to thrive. So you got to have the best habitat. Then the third piece of the puzzle is the food chain. Everything at every trophic level has to eat. So clear water is not productive water in terms of a fishery. I know. We all love to jump in a pond in the summertime and be able to see our feet. Well, if you can see your feet in a pond in the summertime, it's not a real productive fish pond as it could be. Mm -hmm. So fertility makes a difference. So at each level of the trophic level of the food chain, each level feeds the next level, which feeds the next level, which feeds the next level. And that conversion rate is typically about 10 to 1. So it takes about 10 pounds of plankton to grow one pound of insects. And it takes 10 pounds of insects to grow one pound of bigger insects and tiny fish. Then it takes 10 pounds of tiny fish and bigger insects to feed and grow one pound of medium-sized fish. It takes 10 mm-hmm. pounds of medium-sized fish. So the food chain is real important as well. Diversity of habitat allows for the bait fish and the large fish to all have. It helps a lot. Okay. Now, we when we start talking more about habitat, it's... What I tell folks is about 25 or 30 percent of a lake basin should have ha- some kind of habitat elements. That's a lot. It's quite a bit more than people think. Yeah. And see, here's the way I come to that conclusion: on any given day, 90 percent of the fish are going to live in 10 percent of that pond or lake. Now, that 10 percent changes with each season because of the water. The water changes temperatures. You know, things are growing differently as the seasons progress. So fish migrate. So those 90% move to a different 10%. So through the course of the, of the winter, spring, summer, fall, the fish behavior changes based on the conditions. Photo period, you know, the day length, the temperature of the water. Temperature is number one. Mm-hmm. That's the number one thing to influence fish behavior by far. Head and shoulders above everything else is temperature. That influences that species of fish. That's what triggers them when to spawn. That's when they adjust because it's too hot or too cold. You know, so the temperature makes a big, big difference. You know, so all these elements coming together make a big difference in, in, in the habitat. So that's in, in the fish's behavior. That's why I'm, I tell people 25 or 30% of a lake basin should have habitat in it because we can't guess which 10% of that body of water that those fish are going to move into. You know, and if you have too much, then it distributes the fish. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you have too little, then it doesn't support and protect the fish long enough to become significant in the food chain. Which is better, too much or too little? Uh, neither one's better. Too much, i tell you what happens, too much gives a certain size class of a certain species of fish an advantage over the other fish and a disadvantage to the angler. I mean, if you can grow five to seven pound bass, but you can't catch them because you can't find them, what difference does it make? Mm-hmm. So, you know, and very, very rarely do I come across a landowner that really can wrap his brain around how much is 25%. You know, in, in a 10 acre lake, that's two and a half acres. That's two and a half football fields. It's a lot. That's yeah, a lot. It's a lot. You know, mm-hmm. and uh, most of the time they underdo it. Okay. And when you're designing habitat, you're trying to create an underwater mm-hmm. community. If you think about that, think about that. Places to spawn, places for baby bait fish to hide, places nearby where they can feed. <clears throat> that's why I like to use native plants in shallow water because that's a, a magnet for bait fish 
And if you got the right kinds of native plants, mm-hmm. that helps grow the food chain with paraphyton growing on the leaves and on the stems and things like that. So mm-hmm. <clears throat> that all comes together, and that's real, real important. I'll say that that one fact was one. Uh, you know, I tell you that I, I went to the institute as an angler. Mm-hmm. I don't, I'm not going to build a pond. That one fact did more for me as an angler, understanding the habitat and where I'm looking instead of concentrating on just laydowns or large bodies of water that didn't have a lot in it, but here's where that is. That's right. That's and right. it's real hit and miss. It's yes. not consistent. Yes. Once yes. you find where that has a better environment in a cove or in an area, it, or sometimes it's just a piece of the lake, then, then you're finding the magic. You're finding a little bit more magic of catching bigger fish. That's you? right. And then when you start looking at your electronics, mm-hmm. are the fish spread out or are they clustered? Almost always they're clustered. Mm-hmm. Now, big bass don't cluster. They're more of a loner. But when you're looking for, you know, when you when you see a cluster of bass that are 10 to 15 inches long, there might be 30 of them in that school, mm-hmm. you know, and you can you can start to see the, you know, you, you, anglers talk about patterning fish. So they pattern where they are and then they pattern what they eat and their catch rates go up, you know, or what they're willing to strike if they're defending a territory or whatever. So that's, that's part of the fundamentals of pond management. Uh, the, the fourth piece of the puzzle is the right genetics you know if you're going to stock a lake you don't want florida genetics in a minnesota lake you want to use native genetics that are going to thrive better in your environment wherever you are you know if you're in missouri you don't necessarily want bluegills coming out of arkansas you want some that are grown by a local fish farmer up there that that didn't import them you know so Genetics play a big role in what it is that you want to do. Now, if you want to grow giant fish, you're looking for giant fish genetics. Mm-hmm. You know, so genetics are important. The fourth piece of the puzzle that's just as important is harvest. You know, look at a pond like a garden. You know, if you don't harvest it, nature's going to harvest it for you, and you're not going to like the way nature does it. You know, I get phone calls every uh, every uh, summer, typically in August, during the dog hot days. We get a few cloudy days, photosynthesis drops, the water quality deteriorates, fish die. And they die because they weren't harvested. You know, so so it's kind of a cause and effect. If you let those fish get too crowded and they get distressed and the water chemistry changes some, the water quality deteriorates, <coughs> you're going to lose a few fish. You know, and it can be a minor kill, it can be a major kill, but harvest is a big deal and Contrary to what people tell you, bass ceviche is really good. (laughs) (laughs) You know, so eat a few bass. So right there, have a party. Have a party. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So is is and and look at look at these fundamental principles as a chain of events. Happy water number one. Habitat is next. Food chain is the third thing. You got to manage the food chain. Now we don't have enough time to talk about the details of that in a short podcast like this. You can find more of that at the Institute of Higher Pondology online. So for you folks that are really looking to 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 grow bigger fish, more fish, and you're going to spend a little time and money on it, I'd say go to the Institute of Higher Pondology and buy into that because that will save you some dumb tax, I promise. So uh, food chain, genetics play a role, and a harvest plan plays a role. And I can sit here and tell you story after story after story. Let me think of one. Um, I see a recurring theme, though, uh, traveling with you, getting to a lot of lakes. The harvest has become a really big one, especially on, you see, real near ideal ponds and lakes, and that's what needs to be done. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, it's, we, we, uh, you, you and I analyzed a really nice lake, mm-hmm. uh, and the landowner's excited, and it's, the lake's in like its fourth year, and he needs to be culling bass, but his catch rates are so high that he doesn't want to mess that up. But it's his babies too. Yes, yeah, those are yes, all his babies. Yes, and what he hasn't hasn't been illuminated with yet is that if he doesn't harvest some fish, what he's going to do is cheat the best of the best because their growth rates are going to level off. And when that happens, and their growth gets stymied, you don't know it until the end of their lives. Where in that particular lake, if 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 he gets some bass up to twelve or thirteen pounds, he's going to be pretty fortunate. But he won't get a lot of them that big unless he gets to be willing to be culling some bass out of that lake. 
because what happens is when you first stock it, you know, your food chain goes like this, and then you let the food chain grow up, and then you add the bass, and after about 18 months, it gets to be about, about right here, and by about two years, they're even. And now you've got so many mouths in the third year that they're starting to consume the bait fish faster than they can be produced. So then your food chain starts to decline, then the growth rate slows down, and some fish start losing weight. That's why harvest is a big, big deal. And the owner's deal. telling everybody to throw That's right. those fish back in the water. That's right. <laughs> and where what he needs to be doing is weighing and measuring a bunch mm-hmm. of those fish, comparing them to the standard weight chart, and then cull some fish that are losing weight or have, have topped off and their average weight's just staying right there. Mm-hmm. So harvest is a big deal. So folks, there's a few good tidbits. If you want more information, go to pondboss.com. Uh, check out the Institute of Higher Pondology. We've got a, a series of books on these different topics. And uh, be happy to help. Active uh, Ask the Boss discussion forum there. A lot of free articles. And oh, by the way, Pond Boss Magazine. Here, you know, mine just came in the mail not long ago. 35 bucks a year on my live Facebook live pro, uh, um, shows that I've done in the past. I tell people it's 35 bucks a year, cheaper than a Friday night date, and it lasts a year. So uh, join up with us. We'd love to spend more time with you. We've got more podcasts coming up. So thanks for spending time here. Wow, that was pretty fun, huh? I'm so glad that you joined us. Say, if you're looking for more information, I want you to head over to pondboss.com. We've got all kinds of cool information and been there forever. It's got some of the best articles, topics, got uh, Ask the Boss discussion forum. And be sure to check out the Institute of Higher Pondology online as well. And subscribe to Pond Boss Magazine. That's what fuels the economy of what we're doing to help us put these shows on. So until next time, we'll see you then. Hey, Mr. Pond Boss, tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true.